it's Girl Scout it's Girl Scout cookie season, and we just oh. picked some up. So I'm curious what uh, what you, you you're giving. What's your tier list for Girl Scout cookies? Oh, that's okay. That is a good. Yeah, let's do this instead. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, especially since we'll, we'll we'll talk about my stuff eventually. Um. Okay, I don't know if this is all of them. Is this all of them? I don't know. I just Googled it, so I'm just going off of a basic cursory Google search. Yeah. Um, Man, when I was a kid, I was like, <clears throat> I think before I ever really had something with it, I maybe I had an Almond Joy and it was just too much, but I did not like coconut, so I, I like, wouldn't even try uh, samosas. Oh. Samosas? Samoas. S- Which Samoas. I think they're called Caramel Delights now because I think think samoa is a is offensive i think that's why they is changed it? it well i don't know why they, i mean samoa is like that's a it's a it's a is a race or it's like a yeah because there's like samoan like islands or yeah whatever. um i guess i don't know why why they called that in reference to that i don't know <laughs> <laughs> um yeah but now uh yeah samoa caramel Del- whatever they're s tier um yeah yeah those are those are my go-to my every single time no matter what yeah and then i would say thin mints are (sighs) thin mints were my favorite but i think probably the samos are my favorite now um yeah i'd say thin mints are probably a tier Um, okay i think i would agree with that lemon cookies are a or b i really love a good like lemon or like orange cookie like yeah um peanut butter sandwich is like a like a b <laughs> uh trefoils are c and then probably everything else is like a d or less or i, yeah, or I haven't tried else, it <laughs> they're just yeah i haven't had them or they're just more generic and i'm like eh but I, I feel like yeah, the Thin Mints and the and the Samoans are like the most sought after and most popular ones. Mint stuff is I have to be in a really specific mood mm. to have mint stuff just because it is such a powerful flavor. Like if we ever go to like Starbucks or Big B and it's like in the wintertime Chloe always gets like the like the shaved mint lattes from Starbucks. Oh. Or like the you know, and it's Every time I'm like, it doesn't sound good to me. Like, it never sounds good to me, but then, like, I'll take a sip, and I'm like, oh, this is actually really good. Yeah, I mint, mint, mint yeah. has always been one of my favorite things. When I was a kid, uh, peppermint patties were my favorite. Peppermint I guess patties are great. Candy bar? I don't know if you yeah. know that, but... That is true. I do love a good peppermint patty. Yeah. Because it's like... Because it's like what? Go ahead. Oh, because it's like... It almost, like, chills you. Like, it, it has a... Uh, sort of like a Vicks vapor rub effect yeah, for- where like you take a bite out of the peppermint patty and it almost like clears your sinuses and you get like that kind of cold feeling. Yeah. I love that feeling. Yeah. Um, and then Andy's mints are like, mm. that. Mm-hmm. those are, those are S tier candy. Too. Would you count snow caps in the mint category? Are those, I guess they're more dark chocolate bitter than like, yeah. Cause mint. they have like a little mint. on. Yeah. I don't know. They have, but it's. I feel like it, it almost like evokes a similar flavor. Like yeah, dark chocolate mint. They're kind of in the same, the wheelhouse. Yeah, yeah. It's it's mint adjacent. It's adjacent. Mint adjacent. Adjacent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, half of these Girl Scout cookies I didn't even know existed. Yeah, caramel chocolate. Caramel chip. chocolate chip. Whoa, we went to the same <laughs> one. And then uh, raspberry rally. I do love chocolate raspberry or chocolate, chocolate like chocolate good. orange or something like that. So, yeah, if they do it right, that could be a really good one. Yeah, every year for Christmas we get those chocolate oranges that you have to smack and then they peel apart like an orange. Yeah, those are them <sighs> shits rule. Yeah, they they really do. Yeah, I don't know if uh, yeah, I don't. Oh, I Florida forgot about really dosi like... Those weren't on that picture. dosi dos are good. Those are basically like Nutter Butters. Oh, nutter butters are good, yeah. Yeah. I think dosi dos are like A, maybe. Okay. B or A. 
I'd have to try it again. I don't know if I'm just thinking of Nutter Butters, you know? <laughs> yeah. Maybe they're not as good God as God damn, I haven't had Nutter Butters in so long. Yeah. But yeah, Kalia has uh, friends who, like, one of their kids is a Girl Scout. So I got to, maybe I'll ask if she can put it in order for the raspberry because I want to try that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we went to the store and saw like boxes of girl scout cookies in the back of a car and clothes like i bet girl scouts are here and i was like i i thought that they just sold them in stores now i thought you could just buy them normally you they have knockoff ones like if you go to aldi they they have they have oh caramel coconut cookies Uh uh-huh like (laughs) that kind of shit what would they call them or like 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 the you know like there's reese's puffs and then there's peanut butter puffs what would they call like girl scout cookies they'd be like uh like uh literal girl little girl biscuits (laughs) 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 mom i want some girl scout cookies we have them at home and it's like little girl biscuits (laughs) (laughs) welcome back to there will be duds this is episode 89 and I am your co-host TJ, aka a J Spot, a Jack, a Cheese, and with me as always. As always, I'm Nick, aka Doctor Funk on Twitch. And as always, we watched a movie this week. Uh, that movie being Mishima: A Life in Four Chapters uh, from 1985, directed by Paul Schrader. Uh, it is a an abstract biopic, biopic, whatever we say. Um, about the fame, uh, the famed uh, Japanese author Yukio Mishima. Um, he was super, like a superstar uh, author in Japan, um, poet. He made some movies. He was a model. He was a lot of things. And in the end, he was a terrorist far right <laughs> nationalist <laughs> uh he on uh november 25th 1970 he stormed a like base in japan with a few members of his private military uh they took a commander hostage and he addressed the soldiers uh to try to rally them for a, a coup d'etat to reinstate the emperor um and he was loud um mostly ignored and laughed at uh and he went inside and committed seppuku uh and this movie that is the frame for this movie uh and the inner the inside the frame is his life story mixed with uh adaptations of a few of his his more like yeah yeah uh a I guess now we're in it, but a very, uh, a very interesting, f- like structure uh, that took yes. me a little bit to get used to, but I will yes. say once it hit, I I thought it was amazing. Like I thought the, yeah. like I said, it was like it was a little bit into the first chapter, the first part, uh, because this literally is it's broken. There's chapter breaks. Mm-hmm. This is one beauty art uh yes action um and then harmony of pen and sword uh but yeah so it took me a little bit into the first chapter to be like because you know you have it starts with him on november 25th and then it's like black and white and he's a kid and like the the transition between that he's like i when i was a kid i always watched the world through the window and that's as November 25th Mishima is like walking past and then it like zooms in on a window and there's a kid there and then it's now it's him as a kid and it's black and white and then it's like there's this transition into this almost like Technicolor Temple of the Golden Pavilion and yeah then it's like back and forth with the black and white stuff and you're like what the fuck's going on but then like uh, yes once you settle into it it's yeah the, the structure is like it's one of the I, I don't know. It's 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 re- very, very impressive, the way that it's put together, I think. Yeah, it definitely took me a while, like, as I was watching it. I was just, yeah, getting kind of whiplash from it going from this to that to that to that. Mm-hmm. Especially the the ornate sets that they made for the dramatic, like, retellings of his stories, mm-hmm. which I thought were 
very impressive and very cool had this like otherworldliness to them like like especially like the temple of the sorry what is it the temple of the golden pavilion pavilion uh like kyoko's house i really liked for like the sort of 60s diner i did like that kind yeah. Of thing. yeah and then the but last yeah, ones and, are running horses yeah i i it felt like a like a black box theater yeah 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 where it's you know it's very minimalistic like this like you could see you know I, i'm thinking of like the jail cell scene specifically like that interview oh, i really yeah. like that how like you can see above it so it's like you can see like that it's just like a jail cell in a dark room yeah you know like a set so it's like it's real but also it's like you can tell it's it's acted i don't yeah. know yeah or like the but uh I, sorry finish your thought yeah. no you're good the also in running horses i love the part where they're it's when he's meeting they're planning their uh mm-hmm. esau is planning their attack and then they're in this like square room it's got like the the like screen doors and then they all collapse and then the police rush in yes that was, oh that was so cool yeah that was fucking cool and then um yeah at, at first too like the f- the first like scene in the temple of the gold pavilion i'm like this is weird what like well oh, okay so they, they, they transitioned it in such a i was like is this because i think it was i think it was black and white it was young mishima and it was i think it was like the kid on the fence and he the kid was like oh you you know you'll never knock me off the fence or whatever uh-huh. and so he he climbs up and he stands on the fence and he pushes the kid off and then when he goes to like say something he opens his mouth and it transitions into the kid with the speech impediment yeah in the, in the and so book. i was like is this a continuation of mishima's well, story well, I think that's that's the really like br- that adds to the brilliance of the screenplay is that like the every got like this is supposed to be about Mishima, right? You go into it, you're like, oh, it's a, it's a biopic about this this dude. He, yeah, but it's told through characters in books that he wrote. He puts himself one hundred percent into these stories. Yeah. Uh, you know, especially like probably his his political ideas, his you know spiritual ideas, his ideas on like masculinity, and then ultimately, you know, in in the last one, the guy who plans this assassination literally attempt the exact and same thing yeah. runs away and goes to commit seppuku. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, I, you 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 see it. Yeah, I. But I was like, did he have a speech impediment? Because it cuts it hard cuts to that kid like, yeah, and I was like whoa 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 it's 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 very uh jarring yeah i uh i i noted that it's it's this is something where you know it's like after a a school shooting or something and people they're like who oh who could have seen this coming nobody you know he just seemed like (laughs) such a normal guy and then like you find out that like afterwards they'd been making like there was a dude who did a shooting who was like he had like a youtube channel and he would like freak he would post like updates and be like yeah this is when i'm gonna do it and like leading up to it he basically plotted out like, everything he was gonna do and then he did it <sighs> and like yeah he's like through the course of his career just all this all this different shit and especially yeah running horses and uh the stuff that I read is that like people said like, yeah, it was common for him to do that. But I'm like, is this, is this a retrospective thing? Or did people say that at the time that like, Oh yeah, he's writing about himself because if they knew then like some they're like, man, man, maybe somebody should talk to him or something. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I could see them because I could see. Okay. I don't know why I'm feeling very inarticulate this morning. I don't know what (laughs) the deal is. Uh, you know, I can read something from somebody, and I think you can extrapolate, like, the the author's intent, ideas, you know, maybe how they view the world. Mm-hmm. But also, like, it's a story. You know, separating the art from the artist, I suppose. Just, like, yeah, someone, like David Lynch, who yeah. is, like, a very funny, just kind of, like, 
you know, I just drank a Coca Cola. <laughs> wow, like one of those kind of things. And then it's like you watch Mulholland Drive or you know Lost Highway or any of those movies with like very deep, dark, like you know this is like the worst humanity has to offer sometimes kind of movies yeah yeah and it's like you look at the guy himself and it's like well david lynch isn't a serial killer yeah he's right. not like some sort of you know yeah it's like you at the time you can kind of like read mishima's works and be like oh that's an interesting idea yeah but it's like it's, it's just drama it's just a story it, yeah but maybe there were some people in his inner circle that were reading that and they're like okay this dude's about to go off the deep end that's kind of what i mean i'm not saying like a general like critic or something <laughs> like that like pe- yeah people that knew him that were like oh yeah yeah, he he said this to me the other day, like <laughs> <laughs> just unprovoked walking down the street. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah this this guy is like, uh, just incredibly fascinating. Like, and I think the movie, yeah, like, I I kind of feel like uh, this might be the only kind of way to do a story about him because uh. I watched an epi- or uh, an interview that of with Paul Schrader on the Dick Cavett mm. show. Um, it's a good interview. Um, Dick Cavett's a good good interviewer, um, and he he says that like, uh, Paul Schrader says that like yeah it's it's not it's not a out of the norm that like we don't understand Yukio Mishima because the Japanese don't understand him either. Like he's he's a holy like mysterious like enigma of a person and i think that's why he chose the method of depicting his life through his stories because that's like the only maybe maybe that's the only way of really like getting insight into what kind of person he was yeah um there's a quote from it that i i wrote down because i really liked it because i was I was desperate to see to find out what what Paul Schrader's thoughts on him were because I feel like the movie is a pretty objective like because again yeah, yeah Mishima had some some pretty strong opinions about how he thinks uh Japan should be uh operated and uh and the movie doesn't like it's not like advocating for any of his things but it is like just trying to give a whole picture of a person um and, yeah and like yeah maybe why he's so troubled um and the way that uh the that paul schrader described him in this interview he said and i paraphrase it a little bit uh mm-hmm. but mostly this is what he said he said uh mishima was a functioning schizophrenic he could move very easily between all these different masks and guises and none of these masks ever met and i think probably because in the center there was just a big hole and oh. I think that's so that's kind of what I mean like going like that's why he he did he chose to like adapt the books because like these are you know the different characters in these different adaptations are different masks yeah. that that Mishima Jesus. wore he's almost like a Howard Hughes like figure <laughs> minus I guess like the billionaire like wealth yeah but I feel like Howard Hughes was just like like I have to keep moving and keep doing these mm-hmm. things otherwise like the thoughts will invade my brain and yeah. i will cease to be so i you know because y- you watch the the mishima movie and yeah you can definitely see where he fills in his life with those things like yeah like the like the bodybuilding or you know he didn't yeah. ma- he like self-sabotages about the military and it's like he gives him he, like you know he has all of these grand illusions of wanting to be like a military hero or like he he loves he loves the samurai. He loves that code of honor. Mm-hmm. He loves that kind of shit. And he like self sabotages. And then that becomes his whole ideal is just like, okay, well, I'm going to make my own. Yeah. I'm going to be my own military guy. Yeah. So it's like he uses all of these things. Yeah. To like mask himself. Yeah. I'd like to see him and uh, Kenzo from Emperor's Naked Army <laughs> clash. Yeah. <laughs> so you got the number one emperor lover and the number one emperor hater. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the actually that part um, where he basically, he like inflates his, his illness so he doesn't get yeah. uh, accepted into the military for World War II. So in the movie, th- this is something I found out while I was like, 
doing a wiki dive into his stories. I found this out while reading, um, like the synopsis for uh, his book, Confessions of a Mask. Um, so there that moment, and then also the moment earlier where he's talking about I saw this picture of like Saint Sebastian or whatever. It's the dude mm-hmm. with the arrows with the, in him. Yeah. So those are taken from the book. That's that's not th- those moments. They're presented as real or as as Mishima's past in the movie, but those are also yeah. taken from a book. Interesting. And I I think huh. that that adds to the again like the blurring of like what is real and what is not in yeah. in all of his books. But then like uh and you have like real life thing that kind of like proof for that like the you know these are him um yeah because like there's the part later where where mishima himself poses like saint sebastian yes and that's an actual photo like he actually did that um so it's like you can kind of extrapolate that like this is him talking yeah right now yeah yeah um uh yeah and uh I think I think it was Paul Schrader. He might have been taking it from somebody else too, but that like basically as his life went on, he thinks that basically what happened is that to he himself his life started becoming blurred between his characters and reality until he was just completely lost in it and he thinks that that's he thinks that that's what his like final years were where he's just like completely completely enwrapped in his own in like his own perception of art you know yeah very preoccupied yep. with art and the body being art and mm-hmm. yeah what was the there's like a really good quote <clears throat> this is something like he'd like to be beautiful once and then just like flare out flame out or something yeah like that, or... something like that or like turn to embers or ash or something like yeah. that. yeah 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 this is definitely a movie that i'd have to watch again i think to really sure. once i once i figured out how it was structuring everything mm-hmm. i think going back and watching it again i think it would make a lot more sense to me because i think maybe like a quarter to halfway through i was still just like i'm seeing pictures in front of me and i don't know what's <laughs> going on yeah <laughs> but like yeah once it once it kind of cut back and forth from like it was like the day that they were going to storm this thing i was like oh okay these are like his stories i wasn't sure how many of them were like autobiographical or not like i was like man what a wild life this dude led he was a disabled monk who then (laughs) slept with an old lady to keep his mom's shop going yeah (laughs) yeah and then he oh he already committed seppuku and now he's doing it again (laughs) it's a botched a botched seppuku (laughs) yeah uh yeah well uh actually the I don't know if any of the other ones were in this, but the Temple of the Golden Pavilion is based on not not him, but it is based on a. It's on a true story, a real right? Thing. Yeah, it happened in like mm-hmm. 1950 or maybe it was 55 or something like that. But like a monk like burned down this. The Golden Pavilion was like a real place. Yeah, and this guy burned it down and um, he kind of re re repurposed it for his story. I guess he kind of did a blonde thing that I was criticizing that for, for like this thing happened in real <laughs> life and he's giving a reason for it. But I guess a little different because <laughs> the golden pavilion wasn't a person. <laughs> right. Um, well, and I'm sure you came across this while you were reading about it, but apparently uh, Japan, they like banned this movie because of the implied homosexuality yeah. of Mishima. Yeah. Which I don't think the movie was like, super explicit with it like other than like maybe the uh his obsession with that picture yeah of or but it does seem like i noticed every time like he was in an interaction with like another woman he seemed i mean if if we're going with the golden pavilion if we're going with the golden pavilion as an analog for mishima himself Uh that scene where like he's in the the tall grass with her yeah and she like takes her top off and he's just like dude and they do the they do the jaws like dolly focus on her boob. Oh, <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I kind of I kind of laughed at that, and I was just like treating that with the same intensity, just like <gasps> a tit. <laughs> that, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That I that also had a fucking cool shot that 
I'm not sure mm-hmm. if I'll. Well, I can probably blur it or something. I'm not sure if the if the boob is in the shot itself or if it's just his hand. Yeah. But it's like a side shot of maybe she's in it, and then his hand, and it, there's like the reeds behind it, and then the mm-hmm. reeds part, and then the golden uh-huh. pavilion like comes up like in the background. It's so cool. Yeah. How they yeah. like they like increase the artifice of the of these sets by like there's a part i think it's in kyoko's house where he's like lying on the ground and then you see the walls like slide away on these tracks and then like a yes. bed or something else like slides in or no 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 it's another set like uh yeah this yeah set and you can you can room. see him like a, you can see him laying and you can see it fade to black and it pulls in yeah, yeah. like a theatrical like a almost like a kabuki show or something probably yeah, very I'm, cool yeah i'm sure kabuki or no is like a inspiration because he was uh mishima himself was like a big fan of of the that like traditional the theater obviously traditional yeah. styles of theater <laughs> yeah um but it's like every interact like and i think even with like i think it was kyoko's house where it's like he's with a like a prostitute or something like that yeah the, and yeah with a mirror that was like hmm. cool <laughs> yeah what what's what's going on in your head mishima yeah. what's what you got cooking under there like yeah it's almost like uh like a hannibal vic like a hannibal serial killer just like i want to be yeah like you and i you know like that sort of pathology yeah 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 it could be but even then it's like you see them post coital and he's like very cold towards her very yeah. like like it's like i don't know man it's just like he doesn't like being with ladies but maybe he feels compelled to i don't know how much to like you know read into these situations well, and like his personal feelings about it right yeah i mean if uh if the the movie's like to be believed or whatever or um or what am i saying well well like you know of course he's traditional values he if he was gay he would have like he, he repress that shit but he did write about that stuff too like you know he wrote those characters he had other characters that were gay and i think confessions yeah. of a mask the character is gay he had another one called forbidden colors um mm. that uh is about a gay guy and those ones are i, sh- I should mention that those two in particular <laughs> at least mm-hmm. are considered to be autobiographical okay um, so he it's not like he was he wasn't a, a right winger who's like and held yeah. these values, but he was still like a writer, right? So he could write characters and maybe and you know, either it's he was able to kind of put himself in a different perspective or Yeah maybe he's repressing these feelings himself. Right. And I think I it's it's also a very like I feel westernized where like, yeah, he's a right winger like our version of what right wing is yeah. and like their version of what right wing is. It's like, cause like I was, uh, after the movie was done and I was reading about it, I was like, Oh, he was a right winger. Like he was talking shit on the capitalists. Yeah. Well, he I also was like a communist too. So <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I read, I read that after, but during the movie, he was just like these capitalist pigs of blah, blah, blah. And I was like, Oh shit. All right. Yeah. He's spitting a little bit. Yeah. But then, Yeah. Well, he he said he also hated uh, westernization, and yet he was fascinated yeah. with these like these like Roman and like Greek like works of art, which are like that's like foundational westernization. Yeah, um, yeah. Every time you argue with some right wing shithead on Twitter, it's always like a Roman bust. Yeah, <laughs> or like you know one of those <laughs> like bronze aged you know guys. Yeah. And then he was also a fan of like certain American icons. Like he was a fan of James Dean, I guess. Um, he, yeah, I, I saw a, or Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley during that. Yeah, I wasn't <laughs> sure if that was like genuine or if he was like joking because he did kind of laugh. After yeah, it. Um, yeah. I mean, it's like he again with like the Howard Hughes thing. He was very like charismatic for like someone who I think yeah probably had a lot of troubled ideas and conflicting ideas and like well, that, desires that goes with the mask thing again that like he's just putting Mm -hmm. on these different personas apparently like depending on like the day or depending on who he was talking to it's basically like the 
if if you were going to have a meeting with him the conversation was predetermined and like you were <laughs> only allowed to discuss those certain things and if you brought up other things it was like they didn't exist or he didn't know what you were talking about kind of thing. just holy shit holy yeah holy yeah shit. holy shit yeah definitely holy shit how's your sister who yeah your, your sister i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> um and, you know again this i feel like uh i, I had the same point with like emperor's naked army but it's like man the people i wish in our country the people that like were politically active had the balls to do some of this shit though yeah <laughs> like we we talk a big game but man sometimes the, the the japanese people when they're passionate about something they get real fired up it's it's like almost it's like admirable in a way yeah of like following like through. even and yet like even this summer like that one like right wing politician dude got murked by some dude who made like a home depot gun because like what? guns are banned in shinzo abe i think the guy's name was oh in in japan i thought you were saying that happened in the u.s oh no. yeah no i don't know but there's about. like yeah yeah but it's like guns are banned in japan so this dude like made a home depot blunderbuss and capped him in the street <laughs> it's like you know none of us get <laughs> <laughs> Like, can you imagine, I mean, not, I don't, I don't align with these guys ideologically, but can you imagine if like any of the people on January 6th, like committed seppuku on Nancy Pelosi's oh, death? That'd be so like, fucking cool. Like, like the Q shaman, just like on CNBC. That's how you just, know like, that guy's a fake because he didn't commit seppuku. He's like, he's like trying to rally like, cause like, I think the, didn't like the, 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 dc police like shoot one of the pros like some I woman died so. yeah somebody died like, and he... then d somebody got like trampled too i think yeah he's like trying to rally the police because he thinks that like the police are on his side <laughs> and like they, they're just like yeah all right dude like no one's listening he's like all right <gasps> yeah, he just... what if, yeah what if he is in the they were like on the senate floor and he's like got the fu he's got the short sword and he's ready to do it but he just nobody is willing to be he's like holding up the katana and he's like come on who's gonna be my second who's gonna cut my head off yeah nobody would do they it he's like, all right <laughs> insurrectionist Mima. have you seen her the little uh -uh. old lady no <laughs> <laughs> she's like they, it's it's the most everybody who went to that thing is like the weirdest version of that person that could possibly be okay. capital me ma it's this little Cap old lady yeah, okay, yeah i see i see her <laughs> <laughs> wow uh, just i mean she yeah she looks like she'd be like a blood meridian character <laughs> yeah but, but yeah she's got the katana yeah <laughs> which like the movie the movie cuts away when when he eventually does it. Uh -huh. But I was reading about it, and it sounds horrific, because the 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 right. whole the whole idea behind seppuku is that like if it's a so if it's an honorable one, someone else will cut your head off with the katana uh -huh. to like show mercy. Yeah, and I think harikiri is like is that's just the disembowelment. Yes. You die that way. It's like the more dishonorable one, I guess yeah or like the it's like a punishment and they they but, do the disemboweling because it's it's supposed to be like the most painful like yeah. way to kill yourself i guess yeah uh and so mishima does this and i guess they do show it in the movie the guy with the katana is like trembling because he's mm -hmm. like holy shit holy shit holy shit mm -hmm. apparently they had trouble yeah I cutting like his this. head off and yeah. they they it's had to said, three tries three attempts and then some other dude had to come in and just be like all right and then did it and it was yeah. and then the guy who like didn't want mishima to die alone also does it so this other dude reluctantly has to cut off two heads it's yeah like, god damn it yeah i feel like that's like uh that would be so hard to do like people talk about uh like elliot smith who killed himself allegedly mm -hmm. there's conspiracy theories about that yeah, yeah. but he like stabbed himself in the heart and it's like one of the hardest ways to kill yourself just because like your brain does not want you to do it 
like oh. like animalistically it's so hard for you to like because like you need the, the, uh, enough force that you need to like puncture through to your like ribs is and insane through. yeah and like even if you want to do it i think the animalistic lizard portion of your brain stops you and so in order to do it you really 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 have to do it and so i feel like seppuku the mental anguish to like I, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. You know, it's, that's gotta be like he really believed his shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because they say like the people that uh, you know like survive jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge, they say that as soon as they are in the air, hurtling towards the water, they're like, "Ah, god damn it! I didn't want to do this. I shouldn't yeah, have done." That's, <laughs> that's what I've heard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's like your your body is fighting <sighs> against it. And every step of the way, your body is telling you, don't do this. Mm-hmm. And he, he he does it. Yeah. You got to, on some ways, you got to hand it to him. Yeah. Yeah. He the, didn't kill anybody. He didn't he didn't hurt anybody. Yeah. And the, they were even, like, almost, like, polite to the, the guy that they tied up. Yeah. Like, they were like, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to hurt you or just, you know, just get your guys out front. We're going to overthrow the government. <laughs> yeah. It's, it turns out trying to use words to do a coup doesn't really work. Doesn't work, yeah. They are inherently violent acts. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, yeah, and I, I think, yeah, that just shows how, like, fucking just committed this guy was to, like, just an insane degree. Like, how, like, he feels like a movie character because, yeah. like... Uh, and and Schrader even said that uh, I don't know if this is why, but I saw some people say that this is why the November twenty fifth segment is in color. I don't know if I fully believe that this is the reason, but Paul Schrader said that he he looks at those the last moments at least of his life as like Mishima was creating another work of art, like that's how he viewed his life at that point was like, I am my art. And how do you die? You know, he's like, I said, the beautiful have got to die young and I'm going to, you know, this is what I believe. I got to stand up for what I believe in. And I got to commit seppuku. Even there, there's no fucking reason for him to commit seppuku, but he's like, but I said, I'm going to do it. And it's like the most dramatic way that I can go out. And he did it like he did everything yeah. he set out to do i mean except yeah. except you know successfully do the coup d'etat but you know he did what yeah he wanted to do on his end at least yeah yeah you know he's like at least i can say that i tried <laughs> most people again like most people just kind of shit talk online mm. people people talk a big game and they are not people of action and he he did it yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, I, 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 especially with like what the last chapter is called, the harmony of pen and sword. It's like, it's, it's literally those two ideas converging. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, he becomes a character in his own story. Well, that's what the, uh, that's like the samurai code. That's what that comes from. The harmony of the pen and sword is that's what the samurai. Oh, that's the Bushido code or whatever. Oh, it is okay. Yeah. I knew Bushido. I didn't know that was like. I, I don't. I don't know if there's a crossover if Bushido if it's bushido or samurai or if it's like the same i'm i'm not yeah totally yeah. <laughs> you know but yeah um yeah and obviously he was very like i read he was like he by the end of his life he was like like high levels in like kendo in karate <laughs> and in like one or two other kinds of like martial arts and yeah the dude was just like the definition of like t- determination yeah um well yeah i mean he was obsessed with like bodybuilding too mm-hmm. which what was what set that off again was it the like rejection of the army or was it because something like set him off to like being a bodybuilder that's apparently like that's how it's framed in the movie i think it just is that he like i think the it's kind He's of just like a little he was, guy yeah, he just had kind of like a small frame, and he was just uh, obviously as he went on with his life, he just became more and more obsessed with like being beautiful yeah. and right, you know, looking good. 
uh the wikipedia thinks is that he started in he started bodybuilding in 1955 when he was 30 so if it was oh. the military i don't i don't know i don't think it was like just that i think it was probably just a a lifetime of body issues is my guess and he was finally like you know i'm gonna do something about it um and it says from then to the end of his life he never skipped a a single like gym day a day of just uh, just working something out yeah i i've talked about it i talked about it last week and i talked about it before but not i don't think we've discussed the score at all on the show yes and uh i i've like raved about this to you a couple times already Um, (laughs) it's the scores by philip glass uh who is just a he's a composer uh extraordinaire composer uh Mm -hmm. he's a virtuoso that's the word i was looking for (laughs) um he does a lot of non-movie stuff too like he does opera and yes um all kinds of just symphony work he's just a symphony composer um but as far as film i know like a few of his like i've seen truman show uh, I've seen two of the three Katsi movie, which I would say is is probably as far as movie and TV show goes. I would say the Katsi movies are his his most famous, most well known ones. Um, right. I don't know. I'd have to listen to Kayanis Katsi again, but I think that this is my favorite score of his. I the instant I heard it, I was I was just drawn in. It's it it is fucking beautiful. I love his like a lot of people um call his musical style like minimalist symphony uh yeah i would say it's like it's like minimalist like stacked on top of each other cuz it's yeah. it's a common thing with him where it's like it's all these like all these disparate it's repetition yeah repetition and like all these disparate different things going on but then they culminate and they come together and it's it's just, it's really good like the opening theme for, it, theme for this and then the way that it's kind it's of a lo- like... it's movement and i i feel like okay. much like the camera like the you know the things that kind of build on top of each other like he'll start with just a very simple like kind of repeated violin motif mm-hmm. and then you know I'm, I'm listening to november 25th morning right now just just to kind of refresh it all and it's just like that same thing just kind of driving going 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 mm-hmm. and the drums kick in and it just yeah it, it's so perfectly layered to like move everything along yeah um and uh yeah i kind of i kind of lost what i was gonna say but um (laughs) uh but yeah his uh he hasn't done like too much too many like big things lately in, in terms of movies and shows but i have seen a couple more of his i like his more recent ones like i said fant four stick or uh I I seen notes <laughs> on a scandal. It's just been so long since I've seen these, and I didn't know that they were even his scores, so I don't remember them. Um, I feel like uh, I feel like he's sort of a Ennio Morricone <laughs> figure, mm. where he has such a huge body of work that other movies can just like pull. That's from true. It. Yeah, even if he's not credited, like on Wikipedia, I'm sure that there there are other movies that will like use his stuff. Oh, well, yeah. like uh, I'm interested, like Watchmen. Truman Show. Well, no, yeah, he, or he what? did. So that's the difference. He did also do the score for the Truman Show, but they also used oh, songs but from they his also previous used... work. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so a little a little trivia piece is the the song that plays during the climax of the Truman Show is the opening <laughs> theme for Mishima, which just blew my mind. <laughs> it's so funny in context. Yeah. Again, Truman Truman walks through the door. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's the moment in the Truman Show. Like it's it's yeah. one of like my favorite endings to any movie. Oh yeah, and it's got the theme for Mishima, uh, <laughs> and uh, it it also has the a track from uh, Palakatsi too. And then, but yeah, the other one I was going to mention is Watchmen, um, which wasn't scored by him, but they do use two songs uh, from Palakatsi, Pruitt Ego, and Prophecies during the Doctor Manhattan kind of mm. flashback you know the dr manhattan segment where it his origin and 
it sort of reminded me of uh, of House, the, the, the movie, the 19th, where because House very again has that melody that comes up in different oh, yeah, yeah. forms. <laughs> yeah, that's like that's the fun. the very sim. It's very simple piano melody, but it comes up like uh-huh. as almost like a segue piece. But like you know, there's a, di- a couple different iterations of it, uh-huh. and that's the same thing with Mishima. I noticed like there would be this high dramatic moment, and then it would cut to that main theme again as a carrot like i'm thinking of the scene when like the dude the dude assassinates the guy in his house which i thought that was a really cool use of the set again like that guy's reading a book and he gets Mm up and like the his the screens become transparent and you can see the assassin running Mm -hmm. in and he cuts through and then stabs him and i feel like that music plays when he runs away and then he goes and sits on the hill watching the sunrise as he's about to commit seppuku i think that song kicks in again it's like the third or fourth time it happens yeah something yeah and it's cool because uh it's it's like the same melody or whatever the same Mm -hmm. main like notes but each in each adaptation it's different like it has kind of like kyoko's house it's it's maybe a little more like it's that but like smooth jazz variation or something like that to fit the kind of like 60s it's got a very jangly like greaser yeah and then yeah I don't remember the exact specifics, but you have that same theme, but it's just it's altered slightly for each each section of the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it's, it's fantastic. It's really cool. Yeah. Um, it's cliche to say, but it becomes a character of its own. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um. Uh. Oh, I should have mentioned this earlier, actually, because I feel like it maybe would have put, it it would have been maybe cool to or better to know, like, have this context before we discuss. But um, so that the he like before he leaves his house at the very beginning on November twenty fifth, he's like he sets down like a thing. He's like he's finished writing something. I didn't know what that was. Uh, it turns out it was the final book in his Sea of Fertility tetralogy, which oh. uh, Running Horses is the second book in that tetralogy. Oh. Um, and so he wrote the final lines to the final book, which is called The Decay of the Angel. Um, and I this is I read the synopses of all four of these books. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's basically about this guy the the like the first book is about this one character and then his friend is also there and then the main character dies at the end and then this the friend character is kind of like he's the guy who's in every story but Mm -hmm. it's more about this the reincarnation of the of the main character from the first one and basically the friend character knows that they're reincarnations and like tries to help them throughout each iteration so the the guy who commits seppuku and running horses that's a reincarnation of his friend um uh and basically this main character like essentially like ruins his life trying to help what he thinks are like reincarnations of his friend and it's just it's like thinking that like like thinking of the author's headspace of like going to like you know he knows like he's gonna kill himself and like the like reading how this this book series goes and where it ends it ends in just complete nihilism like it it ends with like uh uh the main character he like returns to uh he's like an old man at the end of this book series and so he he returns to uh meet with this this other old lady who was the friend the main character from the first book his friend's like fiance uh before he died and he goes back to her and he's like talking to her about him and she's like i don't remember she's like i don't know what you're talking about i don't remember him i don't remember you and it ends with like the main character opining like maybe i don't exist maybe nothing in my life matters at all <laughs> oh my and like God. that's how that's how it ends that's how the like his final work ends and that's what he published or that's what he literally like mailed out the morning that he he, like killed himself 
Yeah. Well, I read that he had basically been planning it for a year. So it's just yeah. like having that, like, okay, in a year I'm going to do this. And, you know, 30 days I'm going to do this. Just having that in your head constantly yeah, probably takes an effect on you. And I think, I think deep down he probably knew that he, you know, wasn't going to inspire an uprising. Yeah. But I think he knew that he's like, I have to try. Yeah. I have to try. And if I don't, it doesn't matter because I tried. And that's more mm-hmm. than what most people can say. Yeah. Yeah. He like, he, he seems surprised at the end of the movie, but at the same time, it's almost like that's what he was expecting. Like, yeah, it kind of like both like me. And maybe it's like, he had an inkling of hope that it would work. And that's why he's like, he's like, what are you, he's like, maybe, you but, but yeah. then he, when he goes back in the room, he's like, yep. All right. Well, that's what I thought. <laughs> the, <laughs> it's like, sh- it's your fault that I'm doing this. <laughs> the shot and freeze frame of that too is very uh, intense. Like, you see the actor like every fucking vein in his neck like bulging like oh yeah that's that's crazy Um, yeah i mean that's the that's the artwork for the the album mm -hmm. and the movie it's 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 that yeah it's literally right as he's doing it yeah um also just a, a a little trivia piece about him uh he is he's a direct descendant of uh tokugawa ieyasu um who was the founder of the tokugawa shogunate um holy shit it's basically like if you were like a direct descendant of george washington or if like an italian was a direct descendant of augustus caesar or something like that (laughs) (laughs) that's crazy yeah yeah that's all I had to say about that. I just thought that was an interesting thing, considering his values too. Like, yeah, maybe it comes from his family. <laughs> yeah, didn't uh, I think I also read that it might have been that book about like his autobiography or one of them, but like one of the books that was the basis for this movie was translated for Paul Schrader personally. Yeah, Kyoko's House. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I did see that. Yeah. Which like it makes me wonder if any of have any of his books been like localized over here or if they're all still. Yeah, no, I think a a, a fair amount of them have now. Um, like I think you can like, get the the Sea of Fertility trilogy or tetralogy. Um, interesting. And there was even one in the movie when he's like he's like yeah I'm, I need to you know get bigger and then the the guy's like oh that one book that you did is already published in english mm. and he's like yeah but i need more or something like that i, I don't know oh, okay. what he says it is but I, it's not one that's adapted in the movie right it might be the confessions of a mask one maybe the last lines of of his last book that he wrote the morning that he died <laughs> uh it was a bright quiet garden without striking features like a rosary rubbed between the hands the shrilling of c- cicadas held sway there was no other sound. The garden was empty. He had come, thought Honda, the main character, to a place that had no memories, nothing. The noontide sun of summer flowed over the still garden. So it's like, basically the character thinks he's nothing, and he's in a place that has nothing and no no, no memories is how it's put. And Yeesh. Yeah, just a... Uh, guy wasn't in the great headspace <laughs> i could say that at least yes um and oh the other one one last thing and then I'll, and then will be good is uh hit uh paul schrader's brother who he co-wrote this with along with uh chieko schrader who's his brother's wife uh he lit he lived in uh japan and paul actually lived there for a few years too that's probably I'm assuming when he made this. Uh, his brother moved there in like the late sixties or like early seventies to uh, avoid the draft. <laughs> um, and he became Hell a yeah. but he became a pre- professor. Uh, and I I read a little bit about it because he doesn't have like a super extensive Wikipedia page. But like so basically like by day he was a american literature american language professor at a japanese college and by night he was a he was a fucking member of the yakuza (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) 
Uh, <laughs> he's in the Yamaguchi Guma, or sorry, Yamaguchi Gumi, the dominant Yakuza gangster organization in the Kansai area of Japan. Uh, yeah and then holy shit yeah uh and he also while there he made a oh yeah and they made a movie he wrote a movie with paul in 1974 called the yakuza starring robert mitchum from a night of the hunter I'm like damn i want to check that out sounds cool <laughs> that's um, insane and then what was the, there was another movie he made that I I wanted to point out cuz it sounded pretty based. It's called uh, The Killing of America and it's just <laughs> so he made a documentary about like America's like violence and uh you know overreach and all that. So hell yeah, it's you know <laughs> sound kind of Yeah, kinda I mean based. it seems like yeah the schrader brothers or especially paul like we've kind of talked a little bit about paul like being very outspoken and opinionated on kind of shit mm-hmm. it's it, it, it's cool that there were those voices and they really i feel like aren't you know those types of voices as much anymore so it's nice that yeah. paul schrader's still kicking yeah yeah for sure um okay I think I'm not now I'm good. Now I got all my all my trivia tickets okay. out of the way. <laughs> um and I I think it's me first this time. Uh Okay. I think I I'm settling on a 9 with this one. Um Okay. I like I watched <laughs> it yesterday morning and it's it's like as I read more about it, got more context just like like I said, like basically since then it's it's I, we watched a it hasn't been literally nonstop, but like basically I've just been consu- consuming stuff about this movie since so obviously it, it made a it made an impact um and it has just kind of improved in my in my mind as I've learned more about it and um but the movie itself you know just like amazing amazing score uh amazing like set direction the color grading like all the like the production of it as a whole is fantastic the directing is fantastic uh again the the structure the the whole way it's put together is just it's it's absolutely fascinating um and just incredibly impressive um uh and i this is one where like i wouldn't be surprised if if on a rewatch i change that number to a 10 I, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Um, yeah, I, th- I, I thought it was just <laughs> like, just, uh, just a beautiful movie, um, about a fascinating troubled, but ultimately just, well, I already said it fascinating character. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to, I don't know this this might sound like sketchy but like it it I want to like read his books. I kind of want to read The yeah. Sea of Fertility even though it sounds like I might want to kill myself afterwards. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, not a lot of uplifting stuff in that catalog it seems. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's a it's a 9 for me. Okay. Uh I'm going to be I'm also going to asterisk this one because I do think I need a second viewing Mm -hmm. and I do need to like, you know, spend a day reading about this dude and watching videos. Yeah. (laughs) As it stands, I'm like, I'm at a seven. Okay. It didn't, it didn't hit me as hard. Uh, I mean, definitely it took me a while to like fully get into it. But once I got into it, I was like, okay, this is pretty sick. Mm -hmm. You know, the music was fantastic. I really liked the elaborate sets that they did to like kind of showcase like Mishima's stories and like sort of blurring that line between his stories and like autobiographical moments from his own life. Um, yeah, it's just, I, I think I need to really learn more about the dude and learn more. It, it makes me want to like learn more about the guys involved. Like the movie itself yeah. is almost like a catalyst yeah. for me to like want to learn more about this dude's life. So, you know, yeah. like you said, it'll probably get bumped up on a repeat viewing but right now 
That's like a strong seven, like a high seven, but that's where I'm at. Okay. 7.5. Yeah, let's let's go with that one. <laughs> if you, if you want to round it up. <laughs> I, want, I want to try to get my, see if, see if that'll make the average be able to give me a, give it a four and a half star on Letterboxd. <laughs> oh, sure okay. Still <laughs> um, nice. Uh, I got nothing. I I got a uh, transition. Uh, no, we've already used that joke too. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, here's an ad break. Are are we back? Yeah, I'm thinking we're back. Okay. Um, so it's it's now when you're listening to this, the Oscars just happened. Wow. I can't believe that. Uh, one I best picture yeah <laughs> and <laughs> who who could have seen uh mrs harris going goes to paris winning costume design i think that's the one that it's up for <laughs> uh, <laughs> who's uh, hosting this is fun after it happens who hosted it's fucking jimmy kimmel again oh i can't believe went up and Jimmy Kimmel, that was pretty crazy too. Yeah. People are going to be talking about that one for a while. Yeah, and <laughs> when I'm I'm just putting my stake down. I'm not I'm not even mouthing it. When they made that cringy joke about the Will Smith slap. Oh, ah, <laughs> uh, because that's probably yeah gonna, that probably did happen. Well, he's like banned now, right? Yeah, he is. And so I don't know. Maybe because of that, they'll ignore it but i feel like they're not gonna i'm like are are they is it is it a touchy subject for them and they're like no slap jokes it's either yeah. that or they're gonna be like haha this person did a fake slap on this person yeah or someone's gonna be like oh it's okay i'm not gonna slap you jimmy kimmel <laughs> yeah well, what if uh, yeah something like that yeah what if jimmy kimmel he, <laughs> this might make Jimmy Kimmel awesome again. Okay. If he came out in like blackface, like the Man Show, and <laughs> pretended to be Chris Rock, and then someone else came up and slapped him, that would be awesome. Yeah. Apparently, he uh, he very that. much tries to distance himself from that. Like, I think reruns of the Man Show where he did that, he like has fought to like oh, yeah, remove sure. those from online. I'm sure. Yeah. Um. Because he's I don't know he's just like one of those like lib late night guys that cries about stuff now and it's like i don't know yeah you could be that and you can also admit that like you used to do other things that you thought were funny yeah, yeah. i mean i just think he's just not funny like <laughs> that's my problem with him <laughs> just be <laughs> be the oscar just just like have have good jokes <laughs> yeah but yeah but anyway so those happened um Yes, and Oscar's not so white. <laughs> so I'm <really laughs> stuck on this blackface <laughs> thing. <laughs> uh, and yeah, because Brendan Fraser won the Oscar for Best Actor, Ooh, I decided I watched I watched the whale. Um, and he was definitely deserving of that Oscar that he won. Um. No, he was, he was really good. Yeah, he, like I, uh, you know, here's the thing. I'm like, I also loved Paul Meskel in After Sun. I love yeah. Colin Farrell and in, uh, in Banshees of Inisherin. Uh, yeah, I, I like if I had to pick, I don't know, uh, still, but like he's definitely deserving of the praise. Like he he was really great in it, and uh, if 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 he if he wins uh i'll be i'll be happy you know even even though i'm like okay. i'm not sure i'll be happy with it and plus you know you got the 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 comeback kid story behind it like with brendan himself and you yeah know, brendan's I feel just like a, that's... He's, a, he's a lovable guy so i'll i'll be really happy if if he wins the, yeah the i feel like there's like a pretty big campaign for brendan fraser especially mm-hmm. because you know he I think I saw Brendan Fraser's like one of his last movies in theaters before he kind of disappeared. Furry Vengeance. The, ah, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then oh, yeah. he, yeah, he just kind of fell off the face of the earth for a while. 
Yeah. And then like you hear the story about like what happened to him and like yeah. his whole his whole deal. It's it's very sad. And it's like there's probably a good decade of movies from him that we've been robbed of. Mm-hmm. He's in that. Um, uh, uh, it's on HBO now. Doom Patrol, which is I really want to check out. People are saying it's like amazing. Um, oh, okay. he's been in that for a few years, but he's is just that... a voice. Oh, OK. Is that is that a DC Marvel thing? It's it's Vertigo. It's a Grant Morrison comic. Oh, OK. So it's like it's DC owns Vertigo, but it's like it's based on like an indie series. Um, And yeah, I haven't checked it out, but I know like Red Letter Media, for instance, they love it. Um, And I think I think it's more like a the boys kind of comic than, a mm. you know, like a spider or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, gotcha. And he voices Robot Man in the in the gotcha. show. Gotcha. Um yeah, this this movie was so I've seen the theatrical production of The Whale mm-hmm. uh years ago before it was even thought about being a movie. So when people were when it was announced that it was happening, people seemed very like oh my god it's a movie about like this is so blah 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 it's a movie about a like a fat guy i was like yeah it's been around for a number of years like yeah i don't know i don't think it won a bunch of awards i don't think it was like controversial when it came out but i think uh, uh, uh this type of movie coming out now where we have these cultural like it's like fat phobia is the thing and this is a thing it's like different identity groups like well this movie is actually I've seen I've seen people either love it or they're like this is like fat phobic garbage this or it's is like trash fat, I've seen like fat porn fat or shaming. something like that yeah like, or like ogling it and I don't yeah, know like, like I don't know <laughs> so I'd be curious about your read on that where you think it lies on this sort of like culture war scale it's not to use a fat phobic term <laughs> <laughs> scale <laughs> nice <laughs> Because like um, I've seen, uh, I've seen like pictures of Brendan Fraser like going into like the bodysuit, and oh. it's like it is pretty grotesque. Yeah, I mean it's it's pretty good like makeup and practical yeah. effects. Um, I'll give it that. Uh, I I don't know. I I think it's probably an overreaction. Like you know, yeah, most shit is. I don't. I don't know. It's, I re- I really don't know. I I don't I don't know how to, like take that because that's not how I watch movies. Exactly. That's I guess. I'm like yeah. this is a character in a movie, and yes, he is obese, and yes, he eats a lot, and yes, that's what these things. Well, you've exist seen you've, you know the play, so I can yeah. So that's like that's you know how he. I don't know if he died, dies, dies in the in the play, but it's like he he basically does. It does the fade to white that Darren Aronofsky does in like basically all of his movies, <laughs> which means that like <laughs> the character died. Which man, yeah, I will say that moment. I almost like laughed at it because so it starts he, like, with float. <laughs> well, not that part. Like, well, yes, like that part, but yes and no. So like the movie starts. <laughs> he's like jerking off to to porn yes and like then that gives him like a a heart attack or something and basically that's what then like his his friend like comes and like checks on him and she's like yeah you have like heart failure you're you're gonna die um if you don't like go to the hospital so it's like he and then like the end of the movie he's like walking towards his daughter which is like something he could he's do it like unassisted which is something that like he couldn't do and like right as he gets up to her is like the moment and i think it's supposed to be like he's he's having his he's going into you know the the heart attack that's killing him or whatever you're yeah. kind of assuming but like it's like a close-up on his face and he's like he's like looking at her like you know he's got like all these emotions are flowing and then he, he goes like this he goes huh, like that <laughs> and then he and then it goes to his feet and he's like floating but like my thought process is like oh he finally nutted he finally finished <laughs> like a week well, later <laughs> and it's like it's this week long edge that he just he just released <laughs> and it sent him Earth. into the air <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, he, like he died from the recoil <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, I'm just like imagining it from her perspective where like he has this moment of euphoria and like he has this like terminal lucidity where he floats up to heaven but it's like his physical body i know i'm like like, he's he's just like ah yeah (laughs) that's what i thought too i mean like that's why you cut it there right because like you don't want to see the (laughs) aftermath whether he falls on or yeah just like collapsing it 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 it, kind of take you out of the moment but that was my thought too i'm like ooh. It's it's like the anti Birdman ending. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like he's he's putting a lot of lot of hope in in him not going forwards when he because <laughs> like you know it's it's built up like he he's like in that whole final scene especially like everything that's like the music and the way that it's like shot he, he, like. It's like he knows and the audience knows that like he's going to literally die any second. Like the top yeah. the time is is ticking. So it's like yeah, he and like he's his like heart is failing and he's getting up to walk over to her, which is something that is like going to put more strain on his heart. It's like yeah, you 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 very, yeah. you're, you're treading on a very thin ice this, and you are a pretty heavy guy, so it's extra dangerous. This is <laughs> This is this is uh this is gonna be a teaser for my post chat discussion, but this was his uh jerking off with his five point palm exploding heart technique. <laughs> yeah. It was the it was the one palm exploding heart technique. <laughs> um But yeah, it's uh yeah, so I I really don't have like any good contribution to the whole the fat thing. Like the discourse I, around it. I don't have an issue with him playing a fat person um and i'm happy like i i do think he did a really good job dude there's like there's a line delivery in this where it's like that alone i'm like holy yeah. shit like one line alone it like instantly from like not not nothing like i was into the scene but it like no tears to like tears which is like one line i was like fuck like that Damn. all right and yeah and then like he there is like a lot of crying it is very melodramatic um Mm. there's a lot of like swelling music there's a lot of like i will say like every time he moves around the movie does make you feel the weight of like of him how difficult it is for him to like function yeah and uh um every time he'll like because he uses eating as like a that's his like coping mechanism like he said that like yeah. he started when his his partner died that's when he started you know on his mm-hmm. journey um and like every time he'll like something like his daughter will like get angry at him and storm out and that's like the person he's like trying to connect with and then he'll like binge and you'll see him like eating like two pizzas and like and like there's like this really like droning like music and you're like oh oh, oh." you feel like really like bad for you're like no stop please yeah and maybe that's what people mean as like i think that because like there's a scene that i've seen where he like they're like you know obviously it's being dramatic but it's like even people who are morbidly obese don't just like you know bro give me the box and it opens the box and he just like spurts ranch all over it and just folds it up and just like oh, oh, like the like the ooh precious food <laughs> like they don't like they don't they're like fat people don't do that yeah which maybe that's like, sure whatever but it's a movie yeah it's being dramatic yeah yeah not everybody in real life is a uh, yukio mishima other <laughs> if they're not you just kind of gotta you gotta dramatize it a bit <laughs> yeah um but yeah it was it was you know it was solid uh i okay i dug it quite a bit uh is this the first thing aronofsky's done since mother has he done something else no i think i think this is the first one since then um because i i really dug mother i thought it was okay (laughs) um well i guess i I guess i i've only seen mother once it was a fun it was a fun experience watching it in the room with other people for the first time. Yeah. And just because mother has a lot of holy shit moments. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I think that's what I remember the most was just like, Oh my God. 
I've only seen it once too. I could I could like it more on a rework. I I I always like Javier Bardem and everything. Yeah. Ed Harris is great in it. Yeah. Oh, and it has both of the the Gleason boys. Yeah. Donald and his brother. Yeah, uh, cuz I think when that movie came out people were like cuz it's basically like an allegory for like Adam and Eve biblical shit. Some yeah. Shit. And, and I think people were like yeah, people were like, "Oh yeah, well, real original." It's like who cares? He, yeah, like okay, yeah. It's the only movie that's ever been based on something <laughs> before. Yeah. There's like I don't know who said it, but there's like basically five story types, like, yeah, ever, and it's everything is like derivative of those five. Yeah, it's like it's it's like I think people learned like people saw Dan Harmon do like his famous like I know. hero's journey yeah, thing. Yeah, I know the one you're talking. And about. they and it's it's become this like very like soy Reddit thing. So you like or, or like a cinema sins type thing like oh wow hero's journey again how original it's like yeah that's kind of the basis for most things yeah. most movies or shows you watch can fall into that category and it's not like i acknowledged it that means it's bad yeah people think that like yeah like i've known about the hero's journey for probably fucking decades at this point i learned about that when i was a little kid because george lucas talks <laughs> about it like that's what star wars is that, yeah. that's luke skywalker that's his story and it's like it's not a criticism it's just like yeah yeah it's like that's how that's a framework for a lot of stories that's yeah it's not a bad thing it's just it's just an analysis that's just how it works <laughs> you know yeah um, yeah but i i think otherwise people... it's just like you're watching boring shit you're watching paint and dry like if you don't want something with like a story or like conflict and you know how they get o- over this conflict and resolution it's like that's mm-hmm. yeah this is like the building blocks of stories yeah yeah um yeah do you want to talk about the other one um i <laughs> i don't know i i I'll, I'll try to be quick i guess uh i watched rrr uh you can take three hours if you want <laughs> yeah i guess so uh <laughs> the yeah movie that is uh, I I said in my my review that like I'm pretty sure people are there is some ARG global cabal scale like troll against me about We're, this you, because I don't get it. You're a, you're being gang stalked. You're a targeted in- individual. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Because this is like a it wasn't the worst movie I'd ever seen, which is good. I was expecting. I was expecting to bit like be fighting sleep the whole time. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't. I'd say the second half was kind of that. Uh it because holy shit does it get long in the tooth. There's a part where it's like it does like a flashback for one of the main characters and kind of like it's like him as a kid and it's basically like, "Oh, this is why he hates the the British or whatever because they mm. like killed his family in like this raid thing." And it's it's like it's at least 20 minutes and it's like multiple scenes it's like a fucking episode of tv and i'm like that could have been a scene like a two minute scene (laughs) and there's a there's some bits like that and then like god it feels like it ends like three different times and then it's like oh no now this guy's in prison and then they gotta go break him out but they're like way far away it's like okay so now okay now they gotta meet up again and it's there's like 40 minutes left and uh yeah i i just it's i need somebody to sit down and like explain don't just say it's the greatest movie of all time tell me why i yeah and i'm sure i probably i'm sure i could probably look up some i'm sure there's yeah a shitload of people that i follow on letterboxd are like the most amazing audio visual experience i've ever had in a movie and i looked at it and i was like this is this bollywood movie yeah Nothing, nothing against Bollywood, I, I guess. I think, but it, that just seemed Bollywood seems like a, uh, like, I don't know. It doesn't. I don't think like it's. We don't make fun of it in America, but it's almost like a. What I don't know what word I'm trying to think of right now. It's like a, a not like a gimmick, but it's just like yeah, it's. Uh, maybe maybe it's something. 
Give me a key. It's like a fun thing that we partake in, but we're not. We don't take it too seriously because it doesn't take itself too seriously because it's kind of silly. Yeah. Like there was like a movie with uh, I think it's got the dude from Lost, uh, Saeed from Lost is in it. Oh, and it's like some like That's a princess. Movie? Yeah, oh. and I remember like I think in in school once like it was one of those uh, half days for band class, so we watched this like Bollywood hmm. movie with because I think it was like yeah music theater here you go and it was uh yeah i don't know we could probably cut this because i'm i'm looking it up okay what is this dude's name naveen, naveen andrews, andrews is Saeed, yeah uh I, I i do like naveen andrews i think he's great yeah yeah what was it uh bride and prejudice that's what it was called <laughs> wow. it's called bride and prejudice how do you not remember? And that? it was it's a Bollywood style adaptation of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Man. <laughs> and I remember it being particularly silly. But that's what Bollywood is. It's and and that's that's where the me thinking this is a troll comes into play. Because I'm like, okay, if 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 I if I saw like the general consensus in these reviews is like this movie is really wacky and fun and you know, I love it because of that. But no, people are saying like, no, this is like the best movie I have ever seen. There is a um a pretty popular he's pretty popular on Letterboxd. He's a YouTuber too. Uh 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 Patrick Willems who had hmm. one in particular that was he said, let me see if I can find it really quick. It's one of the top reviews. It's RRR is I just saw it. Son of a bitch. RRR is the best action movie of the year, the best musical of the year, the best romantic comedy of the year, the best historical drama of the year. And then there's a little bit more. And there's there's no caveats to these. There's no like, you know, wink wink because it's silly. Because like, fuck, the only enjoyment I had of this movie was like I shouldn't say only, but like cuz there the the musical numbers, there's the Natu Natu which is the one that's up for Oscar. That's a okay. that's a banger and that scene is pretty fun. Like in like I'm enjoying that scene for the intention that you're supposed to be enjoying it. Right. It's yeah. Uh, and then the closer, cause Bollywood movies have got to always end on some big musical number. I really like that song too. It's, it's a bit, yeah. it's, it's all, it also goes on a little bit too long. Um, but I like that song too. I like the guys are really good dancers. Um, and the, the two leads are very charismatic and fun. And I was like, after it finished, I was like, man, I would really like to see those guys in not a Bollywood movie in like <laughs> something serious because I really like those, the two leads. Yeah. Um, but it's not like the amazing sort of ultimate tale of friendship that I was expecting. It's just like, it, yeah, it's a bromance, but it's not like I, anything yeah. spectacular in that regard. I think for like, I think okay here's here's kind of I feel like it's sort of like the avatar to like avatar reevaluation and love mm-hmm. where I think all of these people who are who were you know in the 2016 election cycle very like irony poisoned like weird twitter drill type guys uh-huh. I feel like that's become so congested online where I think I've talked about this before it hard turn the pendulum has swung back to sincerity and earnestness where like all the irony poisoned people are now like yeah this rocks because it it's positive and makes me feel good and even though it's corny i am like sincere boy now and all i care about is like sincerity and because like you look at the reviews and a lot of the people that i follow from like leftist weird twitter are giving it five star reviews and saying it's the most amazing thing in the world Mm -hmm. and i i think it's part of that pendulum swing from like irony poison to like sincerity poisoned and in both cases you're being poisoned (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah and i and i'm not even shitting on like patrick willems i was using him as an example because he covers like all those different genres and i and i'm like that's like i said that that's it that's the that's the gist of his entire review and it's just like i just need i just need to know why it's it's kind of (laughs) it's it's kind of like well it's 
it's kind of like, but not exactly like how I felt watching the first Guardians of the Galaxy, which was another just mm. universally loved movie. And I saw it, and I was like, "That's it." Um, that this is the thing that people are shitting their pants over. Yeah, but at the same time, I'm like, no, I don't know. I don't even know if I can get why people like that. But the difference between Guardians of the Galaxy and RRR is that Guardians of the Galaxy was just fucking boring and it's just a snooze fest <laughs> to me but rrr like i was the first hour i would say of this maybe a little more i was like oh fuck i think we should put this in the dud cup because i was we me and clea were like laughing out loud but not for the reasons that this movie wanted us to be laughing like but i wonder if that's what people are factoring into their five maybe but then they're you, like but th- but then you have to add that as you you have to say like you can't just say it's the best movie of all time and you can't say all this shit and say there's people who are saying this should go but like be an like this should be for best yeah, picture and yeah. people getting legitimately angry that it's not nominated for more oscars it's like they have to be taking it seriously then they can't be laughing at it because i'm not gonna watch the room and be like oh yeah that should have been up for best picture like <laughs> because it's the room right it, and this isn't the room levels right like there is competent yeah. there's competent directing there's also some fucking garbage editing i think just just Ooh, awful okay. i hate i i hate the action in this movie it is like oh and so people saying that like it's the best action movie of the year what the fuck are you talking about you can you can't <laughs> say anything about Zack snyder action movies from now on because it's it gave me the same feeling as like watching the justice league and how every other two seconds there's like a slow motion shot just unnecessary slow-mo every other goddamn shot uh and just mind-numbing quick cuts and sh- i don't know I, th- I thought the action was so fucking lame <laughs> Um, yeah, it's anyone anyone who who comes at us for having bad opinions, post your letterboxed account. And if you have a five star rating of this movie saying the action is great, well, we're just going to discredit exactly, you. That. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, I feel like, I mean, similar to this, I guess similar in the sense of like, I don't know, maybe scale and length. I really liked Babylon, and a lot of people online were like shitting on that. Uh huh. And I think Babylon is like the most fun I've had like in a theater this year so far. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's another one that the same sort of like super duper, like sincerity pilled people online were like shitting on Babylon for like, it's just kind of grossness and excess. But then it's like, they, they say that this movie is like the greatest thing of all time. But is it, is it similar in that? It's not probably not excess, like 1920s Hollywood, but like, huge set pieces big dance numbers big song numbers like babylon had that shit too yeah i don't know if there's i don't know if they're similar enough to compare the two but it's it's a very like you know ener energetic movie i guess they're like similar in that way like there is like stuff Mm. like basically always happening um uh but um there yeah I, again it's just it's the whole like are are people laughing at this or or with it i i really i can't tell because that's that's like all we were getting at the amount of time times that these dudes like gave each other the fuck me eyes was <laughs> was crazy like i bet that's part of it yeah uh, okay, I yeah. will say it's it's very clear that they are not like they both have like female love interest. There's no yeah other than them giving like being very very friendly. It's not like it's not like oh yeah they're, they're but for all gay. the all the people who like I ship so and so oh movies. oh definitely if if you are that type yeah go to Tumblr you could make a million fucking gift sets uh <laughs> with you know the the heart things and like the the rose yeah. colored cheeks between <laughs> these guys yeah for sure for sure so um, here's a a four star review from uh noah colwin who is one of the hosts of the blowback podcast i don't know if you've heard of that or yes but uh his i like his four star review terrific movie 
if Eric Harris had seen this before Columbine, either he wouldn't have done it or the bomb would have worked. (laughs) 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 Which is an insane review, but I I really like it. That's awesome. (laughs) Um, Man, I'm, I'm trying to find the the song that plays so these got the two leads like there's like a very long prologue it's like maybe 40 minutes until Christ. they meet up and then there's the title of the movie at like that, oh, okay. that far into it and then after that it it does this like long montage of them like being friends like one of them <laughs> sitting on the other's shoulders as he does like he does like squats or them like riding oh, okay. on a motorcycle down the streets, each other like smiling. The ones like leaning from behind yeah. the other guy, and, like running through a field together. And the lyrics to this song were amazing, but again, okay. not in a the you know in a way that I'm gonna be like, yeah, this movie is great. In in a way that yeah, this movie is fucking ridiculous. The I'm trying to see if I can find the lyrics, but. I don't even know what the song's called. Um, but the lyrics are literally akin to like, these two are now friends. What's going to happen with their friendship? There's a <laughs> secret between them. Will this friendship <laughs> end in bloodshed? This this sound, I have it pulled up because I'm trying to pull lyrics from it. This sounds like dragon sound. Dragon sound. Is that a uh, Miami connection? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's like friends forever through thick and <laughs> it thin. It basically is like akin to yeah, friends, the friend <laughs> song from Miami Connection. Loyalty, honesty. That is, you know, that is kind of what it's like. And but you know, again, nobody is saying that Miami Connection is unironically like an amazing yeah. movie. People, people are like, yeah, this movie is ironically great. But no, RRR yeah. doesn't it. It, it gets to yeah. gets a pass for some reason. Yeah. And I don't get it. <laughs> or it's like people are people are aware of it. Or they're all doing it ironically, but they're not winking about it and they're just Yeah. And I don't I, don't I, I need to find the, the subreddit where where this where this originated so I can get in on the joke. <laughs> uh so yeah. I it's I don't know it's it's like a th- it's like a three point five I would say it's like a right smack dab in between a three and a four I would say damn um I don't know maybe I shouldn't say that maybe it's closer to a three I don't know I gave it two stars <laughs> on Letterbox but cause yeah it's yeah three and a half, but I don't know three or four uh yeah it's got some good songs um <laughs> that doesn't <laughs> justify its length though fuck no fuck no. <laughs> Like Kalia said that like you could take the footage and probably recut it into like a two hour movie that would be way more palatable. And you know, I just I just don't care for yeah, I just I also just don't care for the Bollywood style. But I will say yeah. the first the first chunk I was like, Alright, this is this is not bad. Maybe maybe Bollywood isn't as as bad as I was thinking, but then Jesus Christ, the second half just fucking drags. Uh, and just every time there's like somebody says something and there's like a zoom in and super dramatic music, it's it's like it does nothing for me. I don't I don't care. People people <laughs> like that. They think it's fun. Whatever, I guess. But you can't say that it's the best. <laughs> you can't. You're not allowed. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I just need to find look up some more some more you need to find the right video essay that'll convince you that it actually yes or just convince me that there's reasons i just i just yeah i don't think anybody's going to convince me that it's a five-star movie i just want somebody to convince me that there are reasons (laughs) why people like this (laughs) that's the fourth r reasons this movie is good (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah uh well i guess we're kind of running a little long so i'll be brief uh we watched Kill Bill Volumes 1 and 2. Uh, Chloe had seen the first one, but not the second one. Oh, wow. So I love watching people watch something for the first time. So I was like, all right, well, let's 
let's watch both of them. And so we revisited Kill Bill Volume 1. I think Volume 2 is still my favorite of the two. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is great. Uh, but two, I think Michael Madsen really sells that movie for me, the Bud character. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really love him. I think, I think Volume 2 has maybe... Like, if you were to sum up Quentin Tarantino's career in one shot, I think volume two has it. Is it? And it, it is the combination of <laughs> his violence and his fetish. Okay. And I, <laughs> it's literally when she pulls out her eyeball, yeah. and it's the shot of Uma Thurman... <sighs> squishing her eye with her feet I was, and I think that is like I was wondering if the, it was a foot shot yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it's like you combine the violence and like all of sig- all of Tarantino's signature moves it's like right there one shot <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh yeah just seeing someone react to like well I mean I've said this before but I think Kill Bill Volume 1 the ending of that movie is like the number one movie that I, you know, I'm being hyperbolic here, but if I could like have my mind erased and watch something for the first oh. time, the ending of Kill Bill Volume One, where he reveals that her daughter is still alive, uh-huh. and then the cut to credits is like bar none one of my favorite like teasers into the mm. next movie, and then the reveal of her daughter still just like kicks you in the gut when she's like about to like take on bill and she's in his house with the gun and even the music is just like very like upbeat and she's like ready to go and as soon as she turns the corner Mm -hmm. her daughter is like bang bang mommy and you watch uma thurman go through every single emotion yeah being like i came here to kill this guy and now i'm learning that he's been raising my daughter and just it's so it's so perfect Mm. and uh it's pretty good probably my favorite song in the movie is like in that ending sequence too after uh he she puts her to bed and she goes down to confront bill it's the uh it's this it's a it's a cover of a song by the zombies she's not there oh really well, i no know one tell me about I know the, yeah i know the zombies song i don't remember malcolm that being malcolm in. mclaren it's it's just called about her but it's like um, it's it does that thing that I hate with movie trailers, where they take an upbeat poppy song, and like slow it down and make it dramatic. Uh huh. But this one is really really good. Oh, okay. Because I love the way it segues into the well. It's too late to say you're sorry. Uh-huh. It's like I don't know. It's just it's perfect for that scene. Yeah, I lo- I love the yeah. zombie song. Yeah. Yeah, but that that song is I don't know. Kill Bill Volume 2 has probably some of my favorite like Tarantino-y music. Like, he's got the Ennio Morricone drops, as well as uh, Good Night Moon is a classic. Yeah, yeah. Malaguena, Salarosa, the ending theme music. It's like yeah. that's kind of like Spanish guitar ballad type thing. I love, uh, I don't know where it plays in, this, in the movie. I just know it's in the first one is Urami Buchi. It's a... I'd have to... Uh, how does it go? It's Japanese. No, oh, okay. it's very quiet i don't know oh is that is that during the fight with oren i don't know if it's during the fight uh i don't it's been a long time since i've seen these movies so it's possible oh uh, what scene is that oh no that's the flower of carnage that plays. yeah that sounds right it might be like cre- no, not credits. I don't know. Wait, I, maybe it's not in the first one. I thought it was. I see it on the score for the second one. I don't know where it would be in the second one. Uh, it might it might be one of the like interstitial like she's driving or traveling kind of songs. Maybe, maybe I. Uh, but yeah, just I think it was that's the first I'd... one because japanese <laughs> yeah yeah i think i yeah but i think that's what kind of elevates both of those movies for me is just how expertly placed like the different needle drops are and how effective they are 
And then yeah. I mean that's that's what he's that's one of the things that he's best at. <laughs> yeah, he's he's yeah. always got a yeah. good ear. Uh and then knock at the cabin. We talked briefly while we were playing uh the Evil Dead game the other night mm-hmm. about it, but the newest uh, M. Night Shyamalan movie that I think is also being dragged a lot on. It's very polarizing on Letterboxd, I'll say that. I think some people are like, this sucks shit. M. Night Shyamalan is a hack. But I think this movie is one of those, I guess, pseudo sincerity pilled movies if you want to watch it through that lens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I will. All the All the reasons that people say they don't like it, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Right. But. <laughs> I'm on my I'm on my Lynch shit where like the emotions that it made me feel, I'm like yeah, but I don't care. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I will admit that it does have like all of you know it has a few of the M Night Shyamalan trappings, characters that say things that no human being would ever say, like that shit's there, like his very I guess, his weird worldview I guess sometimes. Yeah, uh, what else did I say about it? Yeah, his weird just, view of language and how people speak it. <laughs> yeah, that's like that's really the big issue with it is like yeah. that weird kind of shit. Uh What did I say? What did I say? Uh Yeah, I definitely want to check it out still. Even I what I don't know. I I think I would have been more surprised if if people did if it was getting like good reviews. But I still want to check it out. Yeah, I and the, I guess there's a few too, eventually. Old is fun. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's great, but old is uh, it's a fun movie going experience. Yeah, I think. Yeah, the other thing that yeah, exposition is kind of dumped in your lap sometimes with this movie, where I'm uh-huh. like, come on, give me leave leave some meat on the bone, leave me something to think about, and be like, oh, that's an interesting <laughs> perspective, but like. There's definitely a scene near the end where, like, one of the characters is, like, basically staring into the camera and just explains something where you're like, I could have thought of that. Or I could have <laughs> tried to figure that out or, you know, get, get you know leave me something. Yeah. But I think what really sold me was Dave Bautista as, like, the, the character of Leonard. Like, have you seen the trailer? Do you know the premise? Mm. Yeah, I know the premise. Because, like, Dave Bautista, who's this former wrestler, massive dude, like, Mm -hmm. basically plays, he's like a gentle giant, where, like, he kind of first meets the little girl, and he's just like, oh, you like catch? He he has this affectation to his voice, where he, uh, I don't know, it's almost like, I think it made me think of Vince Vaughn in, uh, oh, okay, Brawl and Cell Block 99. He kind of has, like, a, like, almost, like, breathy voice which makes him a sound breathy like sort soft. of monotone yeah but like very human but it's yeah. like I, I i don't know so dave batista's character is very much like that where he has a job to do and he doesn't want to do it but he has to do it and he's compelled to yeah and all the whole way he's like i i don't know it, it's it's just it's great i think his give me more dramatic role batista i yeah i like i really like Batista, I, I love seeing him like trying and stuff. He's like he's a dude who, uh, like, I th- I feel like he's really like a genuine like he really wants to yeah. be like a good actor. I f- I feel like he really believes in like his performances and that and comes through in this movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I don't know. I remember watching uh just like a behind the scenes thing or whatever for Blade Runner 2049. Cause he's in the opening mm. scene and that's all he's in. Oh, um, but like the way that he like was talking about that, that's kind of like what, what won me over about like, yeah, you're just like, mm. you're just this little character in the, in the opening scene. Like he's basically just kind of like the setup, like this is what a Blade Runner does. Um, mm-hmm. And that's like the purpose that he serves. But he's like, yeah, you know, I, this character is like really like trouble, blah blah blah. Like, but, and I'm like, like, your character isn't like really important to this to the story overall. But it's cool that he like, you know, yeah, put that much. He thinks about it. it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. People are saying, or people have said that like, <laughs> like he's different from The Rock in that like his he's okay with like his characters dying in movies or like bad I things was, happening or they yeah. they don't come out on top every time. 
but the rock is just like yeah but like i'm a cool badass yeah so i have to be a cool badass in everything yes yeah i i almost made the the rock comparison but i was i i don't know if that was a i don't know annoyed but it's yeah hack. I, I've, I've thought that too <laughs> yeah because i i used to like the rock but yeah i'm just now i'm like i'm kind of over his stick and and just like learning how like yeah he he can only play good guys or yeah. um like he's yeah he's gotta look cool and it is way it is like <laughs> in reality way cooler to open yourself up to playing not cool characters or whatever yeah um <laughs> playing like ma- like human action characters figure. yeah yeah <laughs> or you know playing dumb characters like his character in glass onion you know like yeah silly, yeah yeah uh yeah it's it's way more like admirable the way that that uh batista approaches it mm-hmm. infinitely infinitely better actor than, than the rock for sure <laughs> <laughs> so for next week, we have a guest coming on, and I wanted to, is. <laughs> I wanted to do the the Glen Gary Glen Ross. Put that Evie cup down. <laughs> 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 Don't draw a movie out of that cup. Put it down. Uh, yeah, Here, next week when we, uh, have, we have when we have guests, I have a third Evie. And, and <laughs> I can't put anything in it, so. Yeah, Tell us who's... Evie must be represented on screen in some way or form. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, next week we have a guest. Uh, his name is Jeremy Kaplowitz. He is a comedian, podcaster. You probably know him. <laughs> you said that from... like it was a question. You're like, he's a comedian? <laughs> yeah, question mark. I mean, his most famous comedian thing is the video of him doing stand-up as jerry seinfeld in the mid-90s with a high school girlfriend okay yeah (laughs) math homework (laughs) uh but yeah he you might know him best as the author of those hard times articles that you share with your friends kind of like the onion where you read the headline and don't read anything else and share (laughs) it he's written a bunch of those and uh i had him on my previous podcast uh music podcast and I figured, you know, he likes movies too. I I shot him a, a DM and he said, sure. So he'll be on next week to talk about. Uh, from 2007, directed by Akiva Shaver, Hot Rod. Uh, it is available uh, for free on Pluto TV. Um, Sick. And then for rent on a lot of the other stuff, YouTube amazon apple tv uh so watch it on one of those if you don't want to be spoiled for next week's for for the movie for next week's episode uh (laughs) these episodes come out every wednesday at 7 p.m est on youtube and twitch in video form as well as spotify apple podcasts and more in audio form uh, we also have social pages on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And with all that said, I am your I'm your I'm your I'm your breast. I'm your I'm your pancake nip in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> uh, TJ AK J Spot Jack Cheese and with me as always. <laughs> Uh, shit. As always, I am me. <laughs> I, w- I wanted to do the the monk, but I don't know why I always want to go to imitating disability. <laughs> I don't know why that keeps happening to me. It's the only thing I can think of. Um, I am your Dolly Zoom on a on a booby. Nice. We both uh, <laughs> just <laughs> there's t- there's two sets of boobs in this movie and. <laughs> That's what we are. And a magnificent bush. There's a huge oh, bush yeah. when she gets up. Yeah. Chloe was like, are you watching porn? And I was like, no, nah, it would be it would be like pixelated if I was watching Japanese <laughs> porn. <laughs> uh, Nick, a.k.a. Dr. Funk on Twitch. All right. Bye-bye. Later.